Justin, some would claim that one strong demonstration of the real existence of a real God is the um, universality of religion in its different mm -hmm. forms, but all of them looking to some sort of a supernatural uh, existence. Uh, your work in the cognitive science of religion would seem to undermine that type of thinking as a, a clear demonstration for God. Yeah, I'm certainly not attracted to that kind of an argument for God. Um, at best, it's, well, I see it as rather weak. Uh, there are all kinds of beliefs that are sort of universal beliefs because of the way our minds naturally work that turn out to just not be tr not be so. Um, What's an example? Uh, a nice example would be uh, most of us, when we look at a rainbow, uh, see six or seven bands of color, distinct bands of color. And so I've done this in class before. How, ma how many colors are in a rainbow? And a fight breaks out. It's a six or seven, you know, you get the six and the seven sort of crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and if, you know, but of course that's not right. That's our perceptual system imposes what's called categorical perception on this swoosh of color, right? Mm -hmm. So we end up seeing bands, we perceive bands, but then uh, clever physicists and so forth will come along okay. and say, that's not what's actually there. It's an illusion that's sort of imposed on this stuff by the way our mind mm -hmm. works. So just that a particular belief or a particular perception is universal isn't by itself terribly strong evidence that, therefore, it must be so. Um, and I think the same lesson applies here. And uh, you, in fact, can go one step further and show naturalistic reasons why, even if there were no God, you would still have the phenomena of religion. Well, that's certainly arguable case, right? I mean, it looks like we can come up with a pretty strong explanation for why people have a general tendency to believe in, say, an afterlife without making reference to there actually being an afterlife. How does that go? Well, it might go this way. Um, when we are reasoning about other human beings, uh, we have to make sense of them as physical objects, their bodies, those kinds of properties, and we have certain kinds of cognitive systems that do that. We have to make sense of their mental activities, um, their beliefs, their desires, and so forth. Well, that's a very different kind of thing with different input conditions, a def different developmental trajectory. Mm -hmm. At least uh, Paul Bloom at Yale has argued that putting those two systems together is actually difficult, and keeping them in place is, is, is a challenge. Especially with people that we know really well, it might be a challenge. Um, and so upon death, then, uh, there's a dissociation between these bodies and the minds or the person, whoever that is, whatever it is. Um, so our theory of mind system, that system that makes sense of other people and their beliefs and desires, keeps cranking out um, ideas about what that person wants, <laughs> what they see what they know, because that system doesn't have an off switch when the body goes away. Whereas the body system, yeah, it's got an off switch. We understand broken machines and mm -hmm. they stop and they're done. Um, so maybe something about that tension makes it really easy for us to entertain that something persists after, after death. Why? Because that theory of mind system doesn't shut off mm -hmm. automatically. Mm -hmm. Our person file, as mm -hmm. Pascal Boyer has called mm -hmm. it, keeps generating inferences. I add to that just a couple of uh, little I don't know, dreams or even hallucinations, which are pretty common after a loved one has died. You know, you think uh, you see them or hear them. You've got enough fodder to sort of start entertaining the idea that, yeah, there's some kind of an afterlife, maybe even ghosts and spirits. Now, we don't have to claim that that's false or true to generate that kind of explanation. But it's, it's certainly a fallacy to use that to demonstrate that it is true. It's, it's at least very weak. I don't know if I'd go as far as fallacy for the following reason. Um, generally, we give people's perceptions the benefit of the doubt until they have really strong reason to suspect that they're wrong. They're also, also their memories. So in normal everyday day-to-day -to -day life, if you look at the rainbow and you say, I see six bands of color, it's, I wouldn't say, oh, that's a fallacy. Well, no, you're using the best evidence available to you. Once you have independent reason to tell you, not just here's how your perceptual system works, but here's how it works, and 
it's not the case that there are six okay. bands of color. You need that second, and it's not the case. So now I'm going to use religion, yeah. and if I'm growing up and I see all my friends and all my society believing in, in different religions, but they all have a common God, whether it's Judaism or Christianity, uh, increasingly Islam, uh, and everybody does, uh, I, I will grow up with this system, and so it seems to be very natural for people to use that to infer that really there is a God. But then you can come along and show me why, why people will have these beliefs, even if there were no God. Well, uh, I should say independent of whether or not there's a God. Yeah, it's a little bit like this. Um, so imagine you've got a radio, you're playing around with the tuner, uh, you form the impression that someone is broadcasting a message to you. I play around with the radio and I go, no, I'm just not getting it. Sorry, I, I don't have that same impression. And then we get an, a, a radio expert come in and tell us exactly how that radio works. Well, that doesn't give us actually any new information about whether or not there is someone broadcasting, a real someone out there who is alive and so forth and so on, that maps onto your view. Um, it could be. Um, it could be that uh, it could be that there is. It could be that there isn't. Yeah, but but the radio is testable for sure. You could use the all radio independent is, but all. whether or not there is an actual signal being sent of a real person out there broadcasting to you, as opposed to maybe the uh, the sender is somewhere here between the two of us, and we're just picking up bits and pieces of us, mm -hmm. or whether it's just noise that uh -huh. you interpret as uh -huh. learning how the radio works only in some cases is going to give us relevant information. Um, so I think it's it's just more complicated, right? Uh, sometimes I think you're right. We The new evidence about the way the radio works or the new evidence about the way beliefs are formed might change the playing field a little bit, one way or the other. But certainly you're not going to be believing in God because of the existence of religion. On but certainly own. that is, sure seems like weak evidence because, as I say, lots of people believe in lots of things for maybe very good reasons. It's not good evidence um, that the thing they believe in actually exists.